Gentlemen, on the 8th of December 2017, a petition signed by 2,390 Western Wards residents was handed in to Councillor Woodward at these offices. I'm speaking to you today as lead petitioner as we feel the petition has not been handled properly. We felt the need to sign a petition as the residents of the Western Wards are extremely frustrated that they are not being listened to and their views are not being taken into account in the consultation over the draft plan. A protest march of almost 500 residents and hundreds of objection letters feel like they've had no impact. The petition gave us the opportunity to get our voices heard and demonstrate the strength of feeling amongst regi residents who share concerns on the biggest change to the look, feel and culture of our area for years. <clears throat> on the 7th of December, Councillors Ford and Cartwright volunteered to receive the petition outside the council offices, but a day later they were advised to pull out due to the risk of being accused of not being impartial and therefore predetermined. Then they said they couldn't support the wording of the petition. The wording has incorrectly been interpreted to mean that we don't want any development. Residents are trying to get themselves heard and to explain that we accept there will be development in our area and we understand the need for it. What we did want to stop was approval of any planning applications until the petition was debated. That would be consultation in the true sense. The outcome we wanted was to reduce what we consider to be excessive development in the Western Wards, i.e. since 2011-12, to 2016-17 inclusive, 62% of the new houses for the whole of the borough and 60% of the 2,500 houses planned for Greenfield sites by 2036. On the way the petition has been handled and the Council's inadequate response, most of the things that are wrong are detailed in Appendix B, but to summarise, E-petitions are part of the Council's ongoing commitment to listening to and acting on the views of the public. You have clearly failed to meet this commitment of listening and acting. You say the borough is such a pleasant place in which to live and work. Making sure that continues is a careful balance between sensible developments to meet our changing and diverse needs as residents and conserving the area's heritage and character. Effective planning for now and for the future is a key part of this. An e-petition can relate to any issue on which the Council has powers or duties. You have failed to discharge your effective planning responsibilities despite positively encouraging and receiving petitions. A petition of 1,500 signatures triggers a Council debate. You say you tell us when and where the meeting will take place. Despite receiving it in December, you still have not given us a date for the meeting. You say you will respond to petitions with one or more of a list of nine actions, but if a petition does not follow the guidelines set out, the Council may decide not to do anything further with it. Our petition followed the guidelines to the letter, as confirmed by the validation exercise, yet you still chose to do nothing with it. You've given us a variety of reasons for the delay in debating. As the petition <coughs> was raised in response to the consultation on the draft local plan, it would not be appropriate to debate at the next council meeting to avoid councillors being predetermined. Statutory processes take precedence over the petition. One is how the local plan is developed, including the public consultation exercise and consideration of the responses received. Doesn't the petition fit perfectly with that description? The other is determining planning applications, required to do this within 13 weeks. If not, the applicant can submit a non-determination appeal. In the spring edition of In Touch, Councillor Cartwright states, both Councillor Ford and I are very unhappy about this delay to the petition not being heard until later. But this is entirely due to all planning applications having to be determined within a tight timescale by law. However, the site gov.uk states this can be extended to 26 weeks in order to comply with the planning guarantee. You told us what you will do with the petition. 
The council will ensure your petition is referenced and given full exposure at every opportunity to ensure both councillors and the public are aware of it and the weight of support behind it. The petition will be debated when the local plan comes forward for adoption. And for those of you that don't know, the definition of adoption, which has been taken from the glossary in the draft local plan, is final confirmation of the approval of a local plan by a local planning authority. For us, that's likely to be summer 2019, and clearly this is far too late. What did you do with the petition? You undertook an exercise to verify and cross-check it and confirm the final significant numbers of 2,390 <coughs> signatures both on paper and electronically. Do you feel this is good use of the officer's time or good value for money, especially when you choose to do nothing with the petition? Since the complaint against the handling of this petition was made, we were sure our petition would receive the exposure we were promised when the responses to the draft local plan were published. We were wrong. There was no mention whatsoever, and only when I queried it did several petitions, <coughs> not only ours, magically appear on the front summary page. No explanation was given, but an FOI established that the petitions had been added retrospectively on the date I questioned its absence. Was it an error, or another <coughs> deliberate attempt to sweep our petition under the carpet? <coughs> Predetermination. I have real concerns over how FBC interprets and applies Section 25 of the Localism Act 2011 and the Code of Conduct. It clarifies that members may campaign and represent their constituents and then speak and vote on those issues without fear of breaking the rules on predetermination. <coughs> predetermination is about bias and making up your mind and making that known in advance, which is not acceptable and predisposition, which is about having an open mind and weighing up all the information, which is acceptable. By delaying the debate on <coughs> the petition, is this council not biased against the petitioners? To use one of your own analogies, a juror in a court of law, before hearing the evidence, indicates they are going to find the defendant guilty. I'd like to use the same analogy to describe our situation. Imagine the jury sentences the defendant to prison before hearing the evidence and delays hearing it until much later. A petition is not just a meaningless list of names and addresses, but a statement of real concerns from a significant number of residents whose lives will be turned upside down through the sheer volume of unsustainable development proposed and in some cases already permitted. <coughs> You claim we welcome petitions and understand they are an important way for you to let us know about your concerns. Then why is it sat in an FPC cupboard somewhere, whilst at the same time many of the sites proposed in the draft local plan are applying for and obtaining planning permission? In fact, why do you have a petition scheme? The policies and guidelines are stacked in favour of applicants and stacked against residents. Where policies are designed to protect everyone, including residents, mm -hmm. they are applied in an inconsistent way and in favour of <coughs> applicants and developers. This petition is just one example of that happening. Applicants have the right to have planning applications decided within 13 weeks and the right to appeal, whereas 2,400 residents have nothing more than an open-ended promise of scheduling the petition debate when the local plan comes forward for adoption. No time limit, no right of appeal for us, but too late to take our views into account. In the complaint, we set out what the council should do to put things right in this case. We want to engage and have discussions with council planning officers and the developers to consider how we can have a coordinated plan that residents can live with, but which can also ease the enormous pressure on planners to build as much as they can squeeze into our green fields to give residents a say in the types of open spaces and properties would be a healthy and a much more satisfactory way forward for all concerned. 